Hello, and welcome to my Final Fantasy X HD Remaster No Mix Speedrun demonstration video. Before we begin, there's some things I want to talk about first to help ease us into just what this video is exactly about. For clarity, this video is not an actual speedrun. It's just a demonstration of the overall route. An actual speedrun for Final Fantasy X is around 10 hours long, and this video is only under 3 hours long. The parts of the run that are not critical to the route are cut out, which are things like overworld movement, cutscenes, how to complete all the Cloister of Trials, and how to win the Blitzball game. Now what will be covered includes all battles, items to pick up, doing in-game menus, important dialogue options, and three different cutscene skips. So a Final Fantasy X speedrun is like a huge gauntlet of boss fights with very minimal amounts of grinding levels from random battles. Each boss fight has a script that we follow, and as long as you do the same order of commands every time, you'll always win the fight. However, not every fight is 100% guaranteed. Some can fail with bad RNG, but it's rare to happen and I'll cover where this applies as the video progresses. Now the category to be ran here is the No Mix category, which is an alternative category from any percent. It's called No Mix because we don't use Riku's Mix Overdrive at all, except for the one in the Force tutorial. So in any percent, mix is used in every boss fight once Riku joins the party, and it definitely is beneficial for speed, but in a way, it trivializes the rest of the run. So as a challenge, we exclude the use of mix and see if we can still speedrun through the game utilizing other strategies. This completely changes how we fight each boss and makes for a very interesting route that is more involved than any percent is, in my opinion. Having all that in mind, something very important to note about this video is that this Nomix route is specifically for the HD Remastered version of the game. The Nomix route for the PS2 version will not work on HD Remaster because of one very specific change and that is the ability Quick Hit. Quick Hit allows a character to get their next turn in three times faster than normal, allowing many successive turns in a row. However, this was changed in HD Remaster, likely due to being overpowered, and Quick Hit is now only half as effective as before, meaning boss fights won't play out the same, and trying to run the PS2 No Mix route on HD Remaster is just not possible. So to my knowledge, there wasn't a No Mix route for HD Remaster, and so I decided to route it out myself, using the original No Mix route as a roadmap. I wanted to find out if a new route was even possible, one that could be ran with consistently successful scripts. I was up for the challenge, and I came up with a finalized route that has lots of significant changes from the original PS2 route. I'm very excited to share what I found, and I hope you enjoy the video. And one final note before we start, at the time of this recording, the current route for Any% percent is the Bahamut route, where Riku's mix is not the major strategy used, and instead Bahamut is utilized heavily to end boss fights quickly. Now I finished routing this out in 2018 before the Bahamut route was being used for any percent. So when I'm making comparisons to any percent strategies, I'm referring to the pre-Bahamut route, and I wanted to clarify that before we continue. Speaking of which, let's get this started. This is how to speedrun Final Fantasy X No Mix exclusively on HD Remaster. These ones don't Alright, so starting off the run in Xanarkin, we're going to defend with Titus before attacking, and this skips some dialogue actually, already saving us some time. Then we just keep attacking from there. So the run will look very identical to Any% for quite a while, really until we get Riku. There's only some minor differences in Killika and Mushroom Rock Road really up until then. So, heading into the fight with Sinspawn Ames, we have a tutorial on overdrives, which are powerful abilities that each character can use. Orin and Titus's overdrives have a timed minigame to complete, which will deal higher damage the faster it's completed. If we input Orin's overdrive here fast enough, we can kill all the Sin scales right away and be left with just the boss to kill. So 
So a character's overdrive gauge will fill up when they take damage, as you can see here. This is actually based on the current overdrive mode they are using, and the default mode is stoic, which is based on taking damage. We won't be using any other modes in the run, but it's worth pointing out why it works that way mechanically. So anyway, we can't lose this battle once the Sin Scales are killed, because Sin Spawn Ames only cast Demi. Demi will deal damage equal to 25% of a target's total HP, which means it cannot kill Titus or Orin, so just keep attacking until the fight is over. Sometimes an attack will be a critical attack, or crit for short, and will deal double the intended damage. Critical attacks can help end fight sooner and save time if they happen. Also, an attack's damage calculation will result in varied damage, kind of like a dice roll that I will refer to as a damage roll. Damage rolls and crits are RNG elements of the run, and contribute to why some battles may not entirely play out the same way every time. By the way, RNG stands for Random Number Generator, and it's a term used to express randomness in video games. Final Fantasy X generates random numbers to calculate lots of battle data, and we want RNG that'll give us favorable outcomes, like crits and high damage rolls. So before heading into the tanker battle, examine the save sphere to heal the party. In this battle, killing Sin Scales will only spawn more, and that'll cost more time than leaving them alone. So Orin will attack himself, and Titus will pass turns with Switch Weapon. Switch Weapon will bring a character's turn sooner than defending or attacking will, and is utilized heavily throughout the run. So there's a turn order in the upper corner, which is called the CTB bar, that'll show when a character or enemy's next turn is. And when we highlight an action for a character to take, we can see how it will affect the turn order before we execute it. Some actions will yield turns sooner than others will, like how using an item is a quicker action than attacking is. Throughout the run, sometimes the turn order will go off script from what is usually expected, and it'll be important to react to these situations accordingly, and I'll be sure to point out when this can happen. Anyway, once Titus looks over at the tanker, simply attack it three times and that'll end the fight. Now heading into Bosch Temple, we will go into our configuration menu and change cursor to memory and aeons to short. This will help speed up battles and will save lots of time over the course of the run. Here in this battle, attack the Sahagans and then Gaskana will appear. So just keep defending until the fight is over, as Gascano is no real threat. So in the temple, we want to heal up the save sphere, and then bring the two requisite key items to the fire pit to move on. So the fight here with Click has two phases, and the first phase is simply just attacking Click. Six attacks will move the fight into the second phase, and if we can get crits with Titus like we do here, it can take less attacks and save some time. So once Riku joins the fight, we have a quick tutorial on Use, which is a special command that allows specific items to be used in battle that otherwise aren't usable from the item command. Now Riku will use two grenades on click, and then proceed to steal grenades until we have two again. So stealing in Final Fantasy X is simple and works like this. The first steal from an enemy will always be 100% successful. The second steal will drop to a 50% chance, and if successful, drop to 25% for the third, and continue to cut the chance in half with each subsequent successful steal. Also, any successful steal has a 25% chance of being a rare steal, and Click's rare steal is two grenades instead of one. So after Riku steals two grenades, she can start attacking alongside Titus for the rest of the fight. Also, if Titus or Riku's health drops below 110 HP here, use a potion to heal.
So on our way down to the submerged ruins, we're likely to get into one encounter with piranhas. We're gonna steal grenades with Riku while Titus attacks, and have Riku make attempts to steal a second grenade after the first here. We'll be needing a total of six grenades before the upcoming boss fight with Tross. Also, piranhas have a rare steal of two grenades, which is always nice to get. So make sure to heal up at this safe sphere before proceeding to the next encounter. Here, repeat the same strategies as before. Riku got the rare steal here, putting us at 5, and with the next steal, we'll have our needed 6. Also, Titus got a crit there and delivered an overkill to the piranha. So, overkills will grant 1.5 times the normal AP that's given, and will double the item drops as well. We'll be getting lots of intended overkills over the course of the run, mostly from boss fights to benefit from the additional AP and items. So once we have our 6 grenades, Riku can stop making steal attempts and help attack the piranhas. Otherwise, keep trying to steal them and don't stop attacking with Titus. If you get bad RNG and leave this fight with less than 6, grenades can be stolen from Tross as a backup strat. And speaking of Tross, we'll start the fight with Riku using a grenade and keep using them until all six have been used. Grenades will deal high damage compared to regular attacks, and six should be enough for the fight. Titus will need to attack Tross twice, and after that, he can defend or heal as needed. So Tross will retreat after hitting a damage threshold, and its next move will be an attack on our party. So be prepared to take the damage from that and not die. Also, we get a tutorial here for trigger commands, which are battle-specific commands that are available to use. Now, we won't be using any of them in this fight, but they are a pretty cool feature for boss battles that we'll be seeing throughout the run. So this fight is pretty straightforward, but it's worth noting that it's possible to get low damage rolls from the grenades, and an additional attack may be needed from either character to finish the fight. Also, I just want to say that the feature of underwater battles in Final Fantasy X is such a cool design choice that really adds a nice dynamic, and I don't know any other RPGs that do that. If you know any, leave a comment below and tell me about it. So heading into Besaid here, we now have Waka in our party, and we'll get into a few random battles with more piranhas. Simply attack with Titus and Waka to finish the fights. So the average number of encounters we get in the swimming section is 3, but with good movement and good RNG, it's possible to only get 2 piranha encounters and save some time. Random battles trigger after walking, or in this case swimming, a set distance, and the exact distance is randomized after every battle. So a combination of good movement and good RNG will result in a faster time for the run. Moving along with the story after the Cloister Trials, we'll have this dialogue again. option that responds to Waka. Make sure to choose She's Not My Type, as it will give a slightly faster response than the other option will. Then we're cool. Once we gain control of Titus, head back into the village and talk to the shopkeeper. Then we want to talk to her dog to get Energy Blast. This is an additional overdrive for Valfor that is much more powerful than Energy Ray. Here comes... hey, why don't you... So the following fights here are all Force tutorials meant to teach us about our party members' strengths and weaknesses. Shabby, here we'll know. learn that Titus is best to attack enemies that are grounded and that don't have any defensive properties, while Waka is best to attack aerial enemies with high evasion. It's important to note that Waka's advantage here is derived from his accuracy stat and not the Blitzball weapon itself. If Titus had higher accuracy, he'd be able to attack aerial enemies just as well. However, the Blitzball weapon does have long-range capability against enemies that are considered far away, and we'll see this put to use in the crawler fight later on in the run. 
So here, the battle with Lulu will teach us that enemies may have elemental affinities and should be attacked with their respective weaknesses. Something about spells to note is that they have 100% accuracy unlike regular attacks. And the same goes for certain abilities, like Kamari's Lancet, for example. So after these fights, Titus may reach level 3 depending on how much AP he has gained up to this point. If he does reach level 3, we'll want to move him along the sphere grid and activate the cheer and strength plus 1 nodes before fighting Kamari. But in the likely case that doesn't happen, here's the Kamari fight before getting the additional strength. Basically, Titus will continually attack and will only relent if his HP is too low and must deal with a potion. However, if Titus gets a crit, or if Kamari misses an attack, Titus should be good to just keep on attacking. And having the additional strength here means not having to worry about that at all, and just keep attacking. After the fight, move Titus along the sphere grid and activate the cheer and strength plus one nodes. So the sphere grid is a menu that holds all the stats and abilities for our party to obtain in the game, and each character begins on their own path to move along. Sphere levels are spent to travel along the grid, and then various spheres are used to activate nodes, which may be activated when a character is either on or adjacent to one. A flyer! True? Why don't we let ourselves? Here we have another tutorial battle, this time learning how to switch in a character from the sideline, and how summoning Aeons with Yuna okay. works. When an Aeon is summoned, they temporarily replace the party, and function like a singular character with their own set of commands. Here we're going to see this long summoning animation that plays, because it's the first time seeing Valfor summon. Every time afterwards will be a shorter animation, because we set the option for that earlier. So after summoning Valfor, simply continue to cast fire on Garuda until the fight is over. Aeons have attacks and overdrives like any other characters do, and they can learn most of the same abilities too, like black and white magic for example. Each Aeon also has their own unique secondary attack, and in Valfor's case that would be Sonic Wings, which essentially slows down enemies on the CTV bar, allowing Valfor more turns in a battle. So in this fight, Valfor has just enough NP to cast fire six times, which will be just enough to end the fight. Valfor's overdrive is also being built up during this fight, and will be needing it ready to go for the next boss fight with Sin's Finn. So something important to note about our Aeon stats is that as Yuna increases her stats in the Sphere Grid, her Aeon stats will collectively increase too. And so the higher Yuna's magic stat is, Aeon overdrives will deal more damage. After the fight, switch Waka out of the party before we enter the next battle. This battle is supposed to be a tutorial for Waka's dark attack, and if Waka was present here, we'd be forced to use it. However, with Waka out of the battle, we can choose to escape with each character instead and move on. The escape command will fail sometimes as it's not 100% guaranteed to work, so keep trying until it's successful. This final Besaid encounter is basically a summary of what we have learned about our party's strengths in putting them to use. Make sure to defend with Yuna before switching her out for Waka, so she gains the AP from the fight. As a note, as long as a character participates in a fight, they receive AP. AP is not split amongst the party, meaning no matter how many characters participated, each will receive the same total amount of AP. Okay, next up is the boss fight with Sin's Finn, and this fight is very straightforward. Lulu and Kamari will use their respective long range attacks on Sin's Finn, and Titus will defend. The Sin scales are no threat, and we ignore them while focusing on the boss. Once Lulu and Kamari each attack twice, we'll switch unit in and summon Valfor. 
So we're going to get an overkill from this fight, and an overkill will trigger if the final hit on an enemy surpasses a certain damage value, which varies from enemy to enemy. Sin's Fin here will overkill if the killing hit surpasses 1000 damage, which Energy Blast can do no problem. Again, overkills result in extra AP and doubled item drops, which are very vital to the route. So we'll use Valfour's new Overdrive Energy Blast on Sin's Fin here, and that'll end the fight and give us the overkill. Also, be careful when selecting Sin's Fin with the Overdrive. It's possible to target the Sin Scales instead of the boss, which is run over if you do. Alright, starting off the fight with Sin Spawn Achilles, we'll see Cheer and Dark Attack put to use here. Cheer raises the entire party's strength and defense stats by 1, and can be used up to 5 times in a battle before it stops having an effect. Dark Attack will inflict the Darkness status on an enemy which drastically lowers their accuracy, and will be in effect for their next 3 turns. So the idea here is to have Titus use Cheer a couple times before engaging, and have Waka use Dark Attack to help mitigate damage. All of our attacks will be focused on Sin Spawn Achilles, so ignore the Sin Scales again here. When the first round of Darkness wears off the boss, have Waka use Dark Attack again, and then have him start defending from there. So once Titus gets a total of 4 attacks in, have him use his overdrive, which should finish the fight with an overkill. Also if Titus gets any crits during the fight, he can overdrive earlier to save time. So heading into Killika Woods here, our first battle is another tutorial, this time for Lancet. When Kamari uses Lancet on specific enemies, he'll learn new overdrive attacks and his overdrive gauge will fill up completely. We'll be putting Kamari's overdrives to good use over the course of the run. Once the tutorial finishes, we attack with Titus so he gets some AP, and then we bring Yuna in and summon Balfour. So Aeons have these unique commands called Shield and Boost, and Valfour is going to use Boost a couple of times here. Boost allows Aeons to build up their overdrives quickly at the cost of taking more damage from attacks. We need Valfour's overdrive ready to go when we reach the next boss fight coming up soon. Also, Shield is like the opposite of Boost, where we take less damage but the overdrive will not fill up at all. And something interesting to note about Aeons is they cannot defend like regular characters can and they also don't have overdrive modes. Rather, they charge their overdrives by both taking damage and dealing damage. And even if an enemy misses their attack, the Aeon's overdrive will still charge. So after the fight, grab the scout from the chest here, but don't bother equipping it to Waka. We're just going to sell it later on. With Titus at level 2, bring up the sphere grid and move him along and activate the flea and agility plus 1 nodes. 
Flee is an ability that allows the entire party to run away from random battles with 100% success. So before moving on, switch our party to Titus, Yuna, and Lulu. Heading through the Kilika Woods, we're going to be grinding battles as we make our way to the temple. In these battles, Dino Nyx and Killer Bees are going to be our target enemies as they will drop Speed Spheres when defeated. Speed Spheres are going to be very critical to obtain as they activate Agility Nodes. Agility is a stat that directly affects how fast a character will get their next turn in battle, and this will influence how our scripts will play out during the boss fights we encounter. We'll be needing a total of 29 Speed Spheres for the entire run, and our goal is to obtain them where available as we move along without stopping to grind for them. So for these Killika battles, Lulu casting Blizzard on Killer Bees should give us an overkill, and we'll get a drop of two Speed Spheres that way. Also, if Titus gets a crit on Dino Nyx, that should result in an overkill as well. The AP we are gaining here is also good, as these three characters do need AP moving forward, but this AP is supplemental towards a necessary AP grind we do later on in the run. Also moving forward, we'll be fleeing random battles that we encounter and only engaging in what's necessary. Which of course the video will cover everything that I'm that entails. So easy on you next time. So make sure to heal up here before heading into the next boss fight. Alright, starting the fight with Sin Spawn Jano. It's possible Yuna will go first instead of Titus. If this happens, defend with Yuna so Titus can take a turn and get AP for the fight. Then have Yuna summon Valfor. So use Valfor's Overdrive, which will eliminate the tentacles and deal high damage to Sin Spawn Jano and open up its defenses. So from here, continuously cast fire until the fight is over. While we are finishing off Sin Spawn Jano, Valfor's Overdrive will build up completely again, and we'll be ready to go for the next battle we summon Valfor in. So after the fight is over, we progress through Kilika Temple's Cloister of Trials and then head back through Kilika Woods. Continue to grind for Speed Spears while heading back. By the time we leave Kilika Woods, ideally we would like to have at least 10 Speed Spheres. We won't actually need them anytime soon, and will in fact get even more before we start using them, but the more we obtain now, the less we'll need to grind for later. After boarding the SS Winnow, give Awaka 1100 gil, so he will give us a discount on purchases from him later on. Make it up to you. Make your way up top and walk over to the Blitz Ball. Here we have the opportunity to learn the Jack Shot, but we are going to intentionally fail learning it, which will save us time otherwise. Plus, we don't need it for the upcoming Blitz Ball match. So here we are in Luka, and after making our way through the story, our next series of battles will be these Machina fights. They're quite simple, as Lulu will continuously cast Thunder while Titus and Kamari defend. 
Lulu destroys the Machina with a single attack, so it's faster to let her deal all the attacks here. The second fight here is just a repeat of the first. The first and second encounters will be a single set of two Machina, and the third encounter will be three sets of two Machina. After the second encounter, Titus may have reached level 5, and if so, have him move along the sphere grid and learn strength plus 1, MP plus 20, and haste. Having haste heading into the third encounter will be useful to help speed up the fight. Haste will not only give a character more turns in battle, but their battle animations move faster as well, which saves a lot of time altogether. Here, we did not reach level 5 before the third encounter, so we miss out on casting haste on Lulu. As a note, casting haste on Lulu in the first or second encounter would not save time as the cast animation would be too long for it to benefit. But in the third encounter, we would benefit from haste as it's a longer battle. What's up with the old dead. Also, Lulu may need to be healed with a potion if she takes a majority of the Machina attacks. This isn't likely, but pay attention to Lulu's health just in case. So after the battle, Titus will likely have reached level 5, which if so, move him along the sphere grid. Haste will definitely save us some time in the upcoming boss fight. Use the save sphere only if you used haste in the third Machina encounter, or if a party member's HP is too low. Kamari's HP was low, so I healed, but he still had enough HP that the heal wasn't necessary. Hey. Alright, heading into the Blitzerator fight. If we have haste, cast it on Lulu, and if not, proceed without it. There's a gimmick going on in this fight where there's this inactive crane and Lulu can cast thunder on it three times to activate it. Kamari and Titus will sit tight with defending until then, and once activated, Titus can use the crane on Obliterator to deal a ton of damage. So there's a 20% chance that Obliterator will drop a Lightning Steel, which is a weapon for Titus. Lightning Steel has an ability called Lightning Strike, which would give Titus' attacks a lightning affinity. If this weapon drops, it will help speed up a boss fight later on. There's also a 7.5% chance to get the Lightning Ball weapon instead from Waka, which can help too, but Lightning Steel is preferred. Also as a note, weapons and armor can have abilities that grant characters passive traits. There's a lot of important routing that goes into utilizing all kinds of weapon and armor abilities throughout the run, including customizing them ourselves once we obtain Riku. Anyway, so from here, Lulu will cast Thunder and Titus will attack, and that'll finish the fight. So after the fight, heal at the save sphere, and I highly recommend taking a safety save before playing Blitzball, and here's why. Winning the Blitzball game awards us a Strength Sphere, and this is 100% required for the route. 
The additional plus 4 strength makes the difference in damage that Titus and Orin will need in order to win a lot of fights later on in the run. So if you lose the Blitzball game, the route as is will not work and there's no alternative, so make a safety save just in case. Also, I decided not to cover how to win the Blitzball game in this video, and what I'm going to recommend is looking up the strategies that are covered in the Any% guide. Practice them over and over as winning Blitzball consistently is going to take a lot of practice and some considerable luck as well. So anyway, after the Blitzball game, we are under attack and must fight a large amount of Sahagan Chiefs. Titus will cast haste on himself and then begin using cheer a total of 5 times. Now the reason why we're using cheer is we want to increase Titus' strength so that he can overkill every Sahagan Chief, which drop power spheres, another important item we need a lot of for the run. The increased power sphere drops here will be required to continue the route as we would run out of them otherwise, and this battle is the perfect opportunity to get the extra power spheres we need. So once all 5 cheers have been cast, Titus can begin attacking the Sahagans. Waka will just defend for the battle because his strength is not high enough to guarantee overkills and we can save a turn by not casting haste on him. So I accidentally attacked with Waka here, but he ended up landing a crit and getting the overkill, so I just went with it and kept this recording of the fight. So after the Sahagans, Orin will show up and join our party, and we have to fight this Garuda. Titus will use Cheer and haste Orin, Waka will use Dark Attack, and Orin will continuously attack Garuda. Titus and Waka will then defend for the remainder of the battle. Also Titus had low HP here, and he probably should have been healed for safety, but with Garuda being inflicted with Darkness, it missed all of its attacks. There's still a chance that Garuda gets a hit in, although it's quite unlikely. So after the cutscenes with Titus and Orin, head to the edge of the dock and open these two chests for a magic sphere and an HP sphere. On our way out, talk to Orin before leaving the area. It won't seem like anything happens, but this will raise Orin's hidden affection level with Titus, which I'll explain more on why this is important later on. Alright, heading through Meehan High Road. The first battle here is forced and meant to show off Orin's piercing it's capability. Awesome. No 
Some enemies have natural armor, which will reduce physical damage they receive, and Orin's weapons will usually have an ability called piercing, which penetrates their armor. Also, Kamari's weapons usually have the piercing ability as well. So here we have our first cutscene skip of the run. This skip is relatively easy on PS2, but on HD Remaster, it's much more difficult. The skip works by talking to this NPC the same frame we initiate this cutscene. This puts us in a state where we can walk around during the cutscene, which means we can skip waiting for it to finish and continue to make our way along. Pretty cool, huh? We can even get into random battles while this is happening. Also, even if you fail the skip, make Maybe sure you talk to the NPC Kazoo. for the Hunter's Spear, yes. which we'll be selling later that. on. So speaking of random battles, we need to encounter a bomb so Kamari can learn self-destruct. This must be done before leaving Nihen Low Road and proceeding into Mushroom Rock Road. Also, as we make our way along, make sure to heal up with Yuna's Cure spell as needed after a battle. Enemies here are tough, and we don't want to get ambushed with low HP. I am Lucille, Cap. So before we reach the Albed shop, switch the party to Titus, Yuna, and Orin, which can be done early if self-destruct was obtained. Alright, heading into the Chocobo Eater fight, there's a dynamic going on here where the boss and our party can push the other off the cliff. If we get pushed off, the fight ends, but it's not game over. We so. intentionally get pushed off here, so we'll land in the low roads, which puts us closer to our destination. So Titus will haste the Chocobo Eater, and everyone defends until the fight is over. Make sure to heal up at the save sphere here before moving on, and don't forget to obtain self-destruct before leaving the low roads, if you still haven't obtained it. Here in Mushroom Rock Road, talk to this NPC for a tough bangle, which we'll be selling soon. Talk to Awaka and buy an ice brand for Titus and equip it immediately. This weapon adds an ice elemental affinity to Titus's attacks and will be useful in this upcoming section. Now we'll go into the sphere grid and Lulu is going to use a level 1 key sphere. Key spheres allow access to areas of the sphere grid that are outside a character's starting path and we'll be able to activate more powerful abilities and better stat nodes this way. So then move Lulu along and get magic plus 3. We're about to begin a grind for AP here and Lulu needs to deal higher damage to help us get through it easier. Switch the party to Titus, Lulu, and Kamari and then heal up the save sphere before moving on. So the Mushroom Rock Road Grind is one of the toughest parts of the entire run, actually. And becoming familiar with each encounter will be vital to get through this grind smoothly and waste as little time as possible. If we get an ambush encounter like we do here, the enemies are going to ruin our party before we can take action. So just flee from these battles. Our party needs to be Titus, Lulu, and Kamari heading into every encounter. So after every fight, make sure to switch the party back to them and heal up with Yuna's Cure spell as well. Watch and weep, Crusaders. So for this grind, there are six possible enemy formations we can encounter. Three encounters have enemies we want to take on, and the other three have enemies we can't really fight. If we encounter a Garuda or any Fungwars, flee immediately. Garudas are slow to fight, and Fungwars can use Pollen on the party as well as use nasty counterattacks that we can't deal with very well. Even if we get a preemptive on Fungwars, it's not worth engaging them, and even though there may be raptors and red elements grouped with Fungwars, it's still not worth the time spent in the fight compared to the AP gained.
So the enemies we are looking for are Red Element, Gandararwa, Raptor, and Lamashtu. Each of these enemies have a general strategy for how to defeat it, and there are three formations they can appear in. Depending on what the exact formation is will change how to proceed in each encounter. So in this video, I cover each of the three formations we are looking for at least once to show off how to go about these battles. These encounters can play out in many ways, and because the fights here are inconsistent, it's very important to practice this section and gain familiarity with how these encounters may play out. So our goal for this grind is to get Titus to level 4, Kamari to level 6, and Yuna to level 11. We'll be utilizing every character we have here except Waka. Each character will have a role to fulfill moving forward, and here's what that'll look like. Titus will be taking out Raptors, and with Ice Brand equipped, he should always kill in one hit. However, Titus is prone to missing attacks since his accuracy stat has not been increased at all. Also, raptors frequently go first and can inflict stone status, which if that happens, flee or run away from the fight. Kamari and Lulu will be teaming up on red elements and Ganderwaras. Kamari will use Lancet and Lulu will use black magic respectively. Lulu could possibly take these enemies out with one attack, but even with that magic plus three Lulu got earlier, the damage needed for a kill is inconsistent so Kamari supports her and their two attacks together will guarantee a kill. So Orin will be brought in to attack Lamashtus, which have armor that he can pierce through. He also can't guarantee a one-hit kill, so Kamari will support Orin as well. Kamari also has piercing on his weapon, so direct attacks will be good to use on the mash twos and faster than casting Lancet. Yuna will mostly be passive for these battles, and will be brought in when convenient to defend so she can participate for AP. Aid us. Sometimes she will need to heal someone if they take heavy damage, so pay attention for that. So Orin doesn't need any AP from this grind, he's just useful for Lamash 2s. Lulu doesn't necessarily need the AP either, but Lulu does need any AP she can get for now though, as there may be a point later on in the run where she isn't leveled up enough and we might need to grind some AP for her, but for now it's not necessary AP. Also, if you reach the next elevator and still need more AP, do not proceed up the elevator and grind for AP up there. The encounters up there are different formations and are mostly Fungwars, so avoid trying to do that to save time. So this grind is done essentially to make our party strong enough to take on the upcoming boss fight with Sin Spawn Gi. Once we reach our desired levels, we can make some movement on the Sphere Grid. Kamari is going to be increasing his HP by 600. This is going to benefit his self-destruct overdrive, as the damage from the attack is influenced by Kamari's max HP, so the HP increase here raises the attack's damage. Titus will get 1 strength, 200 HP, and 2 agility here. The agility increase here is what's most important, as we'll get the desired turn order for the upcoming boss fight. Yuna is going to be using a magic sphere here, and will increase her magic by 10, her magic defense by 3, and MP by 20. The stat increase here is mostly to benefit Valfor and increase the damage for Energy Blast. So before moving on, we want to switch the party to Titus, Kamari, and Waka for the boss fight. Also this grind will net us some speed spheres, and by this point we usually have 14 speed spheres leaving Mushroom Rock Road. We only had 12 here, which is fine as we'll be getting more later on, but the more we have now, the less we'll have to grind for later, 
which could potentially cost us time. Continuing on here, we're going to talk to Owaka and sell weapons and armor to him. We need 10,890 gil so we can buy a sentry for Orin. Sentry has initiative, which will increase the Welcome. chance for preemptive encounters and decrease the chance for ambush encounters. Be sure to equip it immediately. Also, if you got a thunder weapon drop from a blitzerator, be careful not to sell it. If you are short on gil, selling elixirs should cover the difference. Afterwards, heal up the save sphere and talk to Orin for affection. Alright, heading into the boss fight with Sinspawn Gi. This fight has some considerable RNG at play after we summon Valfor, and if we get bad RNG, we'll have to resort to some backup strats. To start though, we bring in Orin and use Power Break. Power Break will decrease an enemy's physical damage by 50%. This will prevent Sinspawn Gi from dealing killing blows to our party. Next, Waka, Lulu, and Titus will each use Switch Weapon to pass turns and participate for AP. If you have a Thunder Weapon for Titus or Waka, now is a good opportunity to equip it as Titus will demonstrate. This saves time instead of equipping it in the menu. So then we bring in Kamari and use his self-destruct overdrive to deal massive damage to Sin's Mongi. Kamari will not receive AP here as he's been removed from the fight entirely. Yuna will then summon Valfor and use Energy Blast as per usual. So from here, the fight has some RNG because of Sin Spawn Gi's specific attack flow. After Valfor's overdrive, Sin Spawn Gi's next attack will either be a physical attack or a demi at 50-50 odds. If a physical attack is used, then the next attack will always be a demi. After a demi attack, however, it's 50-50 again for a physical or demi attack next. This essentially means that Demi can be cast multiple times in succession, while physical attacks cannot happen in succession. So with the attack flow in mind, Sin Spawn Gi will retaliate with three attacks, and there's a total of five possible patterns that could happen, although only two of them are likely, which are the ones that start with a physical attack. The ideal pattern that we want is Attack Demi Attack, which will fully charge our overdrive, but here we got the Attack Demi Demi pattern, and our overdrive was just shy of being full. To keep the fight going, Valfor will have to use shield until a physical attack is used in order to survive. Knowing that a demi will follow, we then use boost to gain overdrive, and since demi cannot kill, Valfor is safe from dying. The overdrive will fill with one boost, and with that, a second energy blast will end the fight. Something to consider that might happen is, it's very possible the attack demi demi Stand pattern back will actually fill Valfor's overdrive, and this will happen if the physical attack has a low damage roll, which will leave Valfor with more HP and in turn, the following Demi will deal more damage and that fills Valfor's overdrive more than lower damage would. And the same applies if the physical attack misses, as Valfor's overdrive will still fill from a missed attack, and again, the following Demis will deal high damage. Also, if Valfor does happen to die, there's a backup strat where we summon Ifrit, however I won't be covering that here. Having to summon Ifrit would be a major time loss that is unaffordable if you were trying to get a nice PB in your run. Anyway, so here we are fighting Sin Spawn Gi's second battle, and this time we have a set party of Orin and Yuna with Seymour as a guest. The fight is quite simple and there's really nothing that can go wrong here. Seymour will be dealing all the damage with Fyra, while Orin and Yuna continuously defend. He'll attack the head once, and then the body five times, and that'll be the fight. So we'll be getting a drop of six level 1 key spheres from the fight, which will be needed in order to progress along the sphere grid. Again, without the overkills, we'd only get half the amount of key spheres, and we couldn't proceed with the route without them. So here on the Jose High Road, we're going to talk to this NPC for a soft ring that has the ability Stoneproof, and we'll be equipping that on Yuna. This will prevent Yuna from getting the Petrified status, and it'll be useful for a boss fight later on in the run. In the Sphere Grid, we'll be moving Waka along 7 levels and activating a Strength plus 2 node for him. 
Waka will be participating in the next boss fight, so the strength boost will help move that battle along a little faster. Also, swap Kamari out of the party for Titus before moving on. So as we make our way to the Jose Temple, we need Kamari to learn Stone Breath from a Basilisk. It's easiest to bring Kamari in when you encounter one, and after learning the ability, bring Titus back in and flee. This ability can only be learned here on the Jose High Road, and must be learned before leaving the High Road for the Temple. So you're a champion. So while we proceed through the story here, there's going to be three different times we'll want to talk to Orin for affection, as well as collect the Magic Sphere and the Cloister of Trials. So the reason why we're raising Orin's affection is later on in the run, there's a cutscene that can be one of three different cutscenes depending on who has a higher affection for Titus. Orin's cutscene is the shortest of the three, so we are manipulating it to trigger when we get there, and this saves a fair amount of time from watching either of the other two possible cutscenes. I won't be including the cutscene in this video of course, but I'll point out when it would be taking place when we get there. Also before leaving the temple, grab this 4000 gil chest, then we can proceed to the moonflow. So while we make our way along here, we have opportunities to kill some bug bites for more speed so spheres. Lulu can cast Blizzard and guarantee an overkill on them, so they will drop two speed spheres. So it's possible to get two different encounters with bite bugs, and if we get the one like here with an Ochu, bring Kamari in and keep Orn around, and have them tank hits or heal Lulu if needed. So here at the next boss fight with the Extractor, which spoiler alert, it's actually Riku, Yuna has been kidnapped, so Titus and Waka are going to team up and take it down. This is the fight where if either of them have a thunder weapon, they will deal additional damage to the Extractor, and in this case, Titus has a lightning steel equipped. To begin, Titus will spend two turns hastening himself and then Waka. Waka will immediately start attacking the boss, and that's all he needs to keep doing for the fight. Once both of them have haste, Titus will cast Cheer for a little boost. So because we have the Lightning Steel here, only one Cheer is necessary, otherwise we would cast Cheer twice. Even if it's Waka who has the Lightning Weapon, we would still cast Cheer twice, as Titus is dealing the majority of the damage still, and he would need both Cheers to have a sufficient damage output during the fight. So once the necessary amount of Cheers are cast, it's only a matter of attacking the boss until it's over. When the boss rises up and gets ready to use Depth Charge, this can be cancelled if we deal 500 damage before the attack fires off. Have Titus use his Overdrive, and the Extractor will lower back down. If it rises again, normal attacks will lower it down just fine. The Overdrive was just some extra damage to help speed up the fight, as well as help lower the Extractor. If Titus or Waka take too much damage, have Waka use potions as needed but only if the boss is not readying a depth charge. Otherwise, just keep attacking until the fight is over.
After the boss fight, we're going to talk to Orin before leaving the area for more affection. So now Riku has joined our party, and we have a Force tutorial here where we learn about her overdrive called Mix. This is the exact overdrive that we are not going to be using for the rest of the run, and excluding it is the entire basis on why this challenge exists. And as I stated in the beginning of the video, Mix is very overpowered. We're actually forced to use it once, so we're just going to mix two potions and then flee the tutorial. The tutorial wanted us to use the two bomb cores we just got, but we're going to pocket those instead. We'll then want to make a quick party change here to Titus, Orin, and Yuna before heading on. So the route from here is really going to change up from the any percent route. So for those of you who are familiar with that, get ready to see some fun, very cool alternative strats moving forward. Alright, so in Guadalajara, first thing we gotta do is talk to Orin here in Seymour's place, then again in the waiting room. And be sure to talk to Orin first before anyone else here. Then on the way to the Far Plains, grab the somewhat hidden chest containing 8 lightning marbles, and then talk to Orin before heading into the Far Plains. So when the dialogue option comes up here with Riku, Pick the first one, I don't chance, care, huh? to get the shorter response of the three. That's no thing to say. And after talking with Riku, we'll be doing the second cutscene skip in the run, Guado Salam skip, and it works like this. We're going to talk to this walking NPC here and wait for the running NPC to run a ways down. Then we're going to head to the shop where there's a cutscene trigger and stop in front of the door, but not get too close and activate the cutscene trigger just yet. We'll talk to the running NPC at a very specific timing, and this will cause the walking NPC to push us into the trigger while this text box is active. We now have control of Titus, and we can immediately leave Guadalajara and bypass a guard that is otherwise blocking us. So now in the Thunder Plains, head directly to the shop. Here, we're going to buy 11 Phoenix Downs, 2 Softs, and 5 Grenades. We're going to be grinding for more speed spheres once we leave the shop, and the grenades will help make that easy. Grab this yellow shield for Titus here that fell on the ground, and proceed into the next area. Also, the Phoenix Downs will be needed throughout the rest of the run, and 11 should be plenty to help keep us going. And the two softs will be used in some boss fights later on in the run. Okay, so while walking through the Thunder Plains, we're looking for two specific enemies, which are Bewers and Iron Giants. Coincidentally, they both can be encountered together in this formation, where there's two viewers alongside an Iron Giant. There's also a single Iron Giant formation, and a formation where there's only one viewer to fight, that we can engage in, but ideally we are looking for the two viewers. Now viewers are what drop speed spheres, and a single grenade will take them out. But unfortunately, the overkill from the grenade is not guaranteed, so RNG determines how many we'll get from them. Also, we only want to use 4 grenades during this grind, as we need to save one for an upcoming boss fight. So Iron Giants are useful for dealing damage to Yuna, so her overdrive will charge up, as was shown in the first encounter here. We have the remainder of the party escape the battle, so Iron Giant will focus their attacks on Yuna. And after an Iron Giant encounter, we can change the party to Titus, Riku, and Orin, as we did earlier. And if Yuna's overdrive didn't fully charge yet, we can charge it more in Makalania Woods. So Riku will go first and can immediately use a grenade, then Titus can immediately flee for a fast fight. Also, Orin's initiative ability only works if he's in the active party. It's entirely possible to game over from an ambush encounter, and we definitely don't want to get ambushed here. So leaving the Thunder Plains with 27 Speed Spheres would complete our grind for them. And if you don't have 27 yet, we still have one more opportunity to grind for them later on. You're wasting our time! Alright, so in Makalania Woods, heal up at the Save Sphere and then switch the party to Titus, Orin, and Kamari. And be sure to grab the 2000 Gil from the chest. After each battle here, be sure to heal up and change the party back to these three if needed. So we're looking for two specific enemies that we need to steal time. items from, which are Chimeras and Blue Elements. In that formation with the Iguian, it's safer to bring Riku in from the sidelines and then steal, because if she starts the battle on the front line, 
She's likely to get attacked by the Iguian and die before she can steal. So we can steal two fish scales per steal from blue elements, or three if it's a rare steal, and we want a total of three before the next boss fight. Really though, only getting two is probably just fine, but having three is being very safe in case we get very unlikely RNG, which I'll explain more on when we get there. So once you have the fish scales, we can keep Riku on the front line while trying to steal the other items we need which are arctic winds from chimeras. We can steal one arctic wind per steal, and we need a total of two. Also, the rare steal from a chimera will be a lightning marble, so pay attention to if that happens, and don't assume you got the arctic wind. Also, chimeras can help charge Yuna's overdrive if needed, and this is the last good opportunity right to do that before we need to use it coming up soon. When approaching the end here, you can touch this butterfly to initiate a minigame where you can't get into random battles, and you can walk the rest of the way encounter free. So we're about to head into the next boss fight with Sphiromorph, and before that, we have some stats to increase in the Sphere Grid. Riku is going to use an HP Sphere and increase her HP by 500. Without this increase, she would likely die in several of the upcoming boss fights that she is much needed for. Yuna will be getting plus 3 agility, then using a magic sphere and getting plus 4 magic and 400 more HP. The agility will increase her turn frequency as it does, but the other stats are mostly to benefit Valfor. So after the sphere grid menu, we're going to heal before moving on, and actually a safety save is recommended here, which I'll explain why in the next boss fight. For now, tell Awaka that his prices are too high, so he'll lower them and then buy the Sonic Steel for Titus and equip it immediately. Sonic oh Steel has the first strike ability, which will give Titus the first turn in every battle no matter what, even during an ambush encounter. This means we can flee any random encounter for the rest of the run, which is very helpful because without it we would likely get wiped out from a lot of the random encounters in the late game areas. This also means that Orin's initiative ability is no longer that important to utilize. Okay, so heading into the Sphere Morph fight, there's a lot going on here and there are many details to pay attention to. Sphere Morph has the ability to change their elemental affinity, and we need to make sure we are attacking with the opposite element to deal damage. There's going to be a flow going on where someone will attack, and Sphere Morph will retaliate with black magic associated with its current affinity. Then someone will attack with the opposite element, and Sphere Morph will undergo an elemental shift in response and the flow repeats. Sphere Morph may actually retain their affinity during an elemental shift, as it chooses one of the four randomly, so it's possible its current affinity may be picked again. Now Riku is going to be dealing a majority of the damage in this fight, while most of the other characters will participate to help keep the flow going, as well as earn AP for the fight. Riku has four elemental items that she can use, and those are bomb cores, lightning marbles, arctic winds, and fish scales. Now the fish scales are not as powerful as the other items, they only deal around 1000 damage, while the others deal around 1500 damage. In this fight, Riku didn't have to use any fish scales, which is the ideal outcome. However, if Riku uses any fish scales, we have to make up the damage, which I'll demonstrate in this black and white filtered fight. And here, Riku had to use one fish scale. So Lulu can help make up the damage here, as she will deal close to 500 damage with her black magic spells. Now we can't deal any excess damage before summoning Valfor though, because Fear Morph has an attack called Press that functions like a demi attack and will begin to use it once their HP is under 50%. Valfor needs to build their overdrive from empty during the fight, and if Sphere Morph were to use Press during that time, Valfor would likely die before being able to use Energy Blast. We also need the overkill from Energy Blast, so it's very important we deal a specific range of damage to Sphere Morph before we summon Valfor. And since every attack is a damage roll, we can't guarantee specific damage, so we try to be as accurate as possible and be within a certain damage range. So for what happens if Riku has to use Fish Scales, the most likely scenario is only having to use one for the entire battle. Riku has to use two elemental attacks, and the chances of getting the same two in a row are 1 in 16 odds. 
And if that happens, then you'll have to use two additional spells from Lulu rather than one. Anyway, so for the one fish scale script, when we normally would have had Lulu switch to Yuna, Lulu will cast another spell instead. Then Yuna will come in and she'll use a potion on Lulu, which the healing may not be necessary, but we need the fast action from using an item, so do it anyway. Then Kamari checks for the current element again, and then we summon Valfor and continue as normal. Also, it's very important to know which elemental affinity Sphere Morph is in before we summon Valfor, so we can use Black Magic immediately, as we can only afford one elemental check while charging the overdrive here. So Valfor will be using two Black Magic spells to deal additional damage before Energy Blast, and we want to make sure we use Sonic Wings for an elemental check in between spells to reduce the chances of Sphere Morph getting two attacks off in a row. Sphere Morph is actually immune to Sonic Wings' effect, but it's still a faster action for Valfor to use than attacking is. So Valfor still benefits a sooner turn from the attack. So with Energy Blast, we get the overkill here and we get a drop of two level 2 key spheres. Also one last thing I want to note, in my many attempts of this fight, sometimes the fight would start and Titus didn't have the first turn. I'm not sure why this happened, it may be a glitch where his first strike didn't activate, but I saw it happen twice actually, and I wanted to point out that there's a chance that it could happen, although it seems to be a very small chance. At any rate, I still recommend that safety save due to how much RNG there is to contend with this fight. So after the fight, we're going to make some movement on the sphere grid. Kamari is going to be getting 6 more agility and 700 more HP, which the HP boost will again result in higher damage with self-destruct, which we'll be using in the next boss fight. Kamari is also going to learn Steal and Use, which will open up our realm of strategy involving these two abilities. Yuna will be getting 3 more magic and 40 more MP. Pretty soon, Yuna will be learning Thundaga and will be needing a higher supply of MP for that. Riku is going to get 3 more agility, then we can continue on. Before exiting the menu, we're going to auto sort our items to clean them up a bit, then use a Mega Potion to heal our party, and then switch the party to Titus, Riku, and Kamari. On our way out, talk to Orin for affection, and this will be the last time we need to do so in the run. So here in Lake Makalania, we have the next boss fight with Crawler. This fight is very straightforward and has almost no risk of anything going wrong. The first move with Titus is extremely important, which is equipping the yellow shield and this will give Titus immunity to thunder based elemental attacks. It's not needed for this fight, but for an upcoming one and forgetting to equip it will result in a game over during that fight, so it's very crucial. So all that's going on with this fight is Riku will use a lightning marble twice on Crawler, while Kamari will use one on Negator, the device hovering in the air. Now if Negator survives the attack, Waka can simply finish it off with an attack when his turn comes. Also here's where we can see Waka's long range capability come into play. Then Kamari will use self-destruct and we can see the increase in damage here with the attack compared to how much it was dealing before. And finally, Yuna will grand summon Valfor and will finish the fight with energy blast.
So after the fight, there's a cutscene where we travel to Makalania Temple by Snow Machine. And this is where the cutscene with Orin that we manipulated to play will happen. So here in Makalania Temple, we're going to move Titus along the sphere grid. Using a level 2 key sphere, he's going to move into Orin's area of the sphere grid and get some nice stat increases. He's also going to get Mental Break, which will reduce an enemy's magic defense by 50%. So for stats, he'll get 800 more HP, 4 more agility, and a huge sum of 16 more strength. Titus will have a pretty good damage output moving forward. So after this menu, we'll heal up at the save sphere, and here I would strongly urge you to safety save which I will explain why during the next boss fight. And after saving, we actually have the third cutscene skip of the run, known as the Jiskel skip. Normally after this room, there's a cutscene where we watch Jiskel Sphere and learn just how awful Seymour really is. But we get to skip all that by walking into the cutscene trigger here while talking to Trommel. The setup starts by first walking down towards Trommel, and then talking to Trommel and getting some dialogue boxes out of the way, including getting the shell target, which we don't actually need. Then we want to tap right on the D-pad and turn around without moving. Then we want to nudge right three times, which each nudge requires two frames of input, one frame for the game to register direction and one more frame to initiate movement. Then we want to tap left on the D-pad to face Trommel, and then walk right and talk to Trommel well, at the same time while triggering the cutscene. This has to happen on the same frame as movement occurs, which again is that second frame of input. If you talk to Trommel a frame early, you'll have to reface him and try again. So grab the chest with 5000 gil, and before walking up the stairs, wait until the camera shifts after Titus' dialogue. Walking up too early won't work, and it's very possible the game will softlock doing so. Also, sometimes the NPC will block Titus like they normally would, but just keep pushing and you'll get through eventually. Alright, heading into the fight with Seymour here. This fight is very risky and will possibly fail with bad RNG. Right away, we have a 1 in 6 chance of these Grotto Guardians using what's called Shremity, which will inflict a character with a confusion status, which makes characters attack random targets on their turn, including allies. Now if this happens, the fight has a very low chance to continue as the script's turn order is now all messed up, and it might just be worth loading that safety save if it were to happen. There's still more that can go wrong, but with no shremedies here, Titus will haste himself and use the talk command on Seymour to gain bonus strength for the battle. Riku and Kamari will both be using lightning marbles on Seymour for some decent damage and Lulu will assist in that with a black magic spell. Usually the combination of these four attacks will end the first phase here, but bad RNG for damage rolls will leave us just shy, and it's important to end this phase on a very particular turn. Seymour is cycling through different elemental attacks, starting with Blizzara, then Thundara, then Watara, then Fyra, and it repeats from there. And during Seymour's second phase, we want him ready to use Thundara, meaning we have to end the first phase before he uses it. If we don't, we'd have to wait on 3 more attacks from Seymour and we risk more Shremonies during that time, resulting in major time loss and again, a different turn order than our script. Hopefully we get good RNG though, so the fight can move forward correctly. So for the fight with Anima, Titus will be dealing lots of damage while most of the other characters will be cycled in and out to participate for AP. It's possible Titus can miss his attacks against Anima, so hopefully that doesn't happen. Kamari will use a lightning marble here, but a bomb core or an arctic wind can either be used as well. So Anima's attack pattern simply goes back and forth between boost and pain. Boost will charge Anima's overdrive, and we need to end the fight before it fully charges. And pain will instantly kill one of our party members, and we need to make sure Titus is off the front line when pain is used so he can keep up with dealing damage. So Riku will use steel on Anima, and hopefully we get three silence grenades. The rare steel could happen, and we get a far plane shadow instead, and if that happens, try and steal again during the fight. We absolutely need the three silence grenades in order to progress with the route. So after the first pain attack, Titus will be brought in immediately to keep attacking. 
We then switch to Waka and use a Phoenix down on whoever was hit with Pain. So Titus will get two attacks off before the next Pain attack, and then usually we'd switch him out for Orin. But I brought Riku in again to make another steal attempt, which was successful this time, and so Waka switched out for Orin instead. Now if you have to grind for the silence grenades, Kamari can also make steal attempts, and we need to secure those before bringing in Titus for his last two attacks. So if things have gone correctly so far, after the second pain attack, Titus can finish things up while we bring in Yuna, and it's important she is on the front line when we move into the second phase with Seymour. Also, we don't need to revive the fallen party member again, just end the fight with Titus and Yuna alive. So here in phase 2, Seymour will now cast multi-magic spells that hit every party member. And if we've correctly made sure he casts multi-thundara, Titus will survive because of his yellow shield that we equipped earlier. Titus will then use a Mega Phoenix to revive the party, and then finish off Seymour. Also, Yuna getting hit here will charge her overdrive quite a bit, and get it close to full for now. So even after winning the fight, we still have one more variable that can go wrong actually, and that would be the drops we get from the fight. The common drop that we want to get are the two black magic spheres, but the rare drop at 1 in 8 odds are two special spheres. Now the two black magic spheres are 100% required, similar to how the strength plus 4 sphere from winning Blitzball is. And unlike any percent, there is no backup strat in case we get special spheres, and I want to be absolutely clear about that. And because special spheres drop at 1 in 8 odds, it further stands to reason that a safety save be taken before this fight. So overall, the fight with Seymour has a lot of potential for bad RNG, so hopefully good RNG will be in your favor for it. So here in the sphere grid, Waka is going to use a level 2 key sphere and move into Lulu's territory where he'll learn Death and Thundaga. Now Waka won't be using any of these spells for the run, but learning these abilities will allow other characters to learn them without having to travel to the ability node itself. This is done by using a black magic sphere that we just got from Seymour, and Riku will use one to learn death. Death can instantly kill an enemy, and the success rate for death to work is determined by the enemy's particular resistance to it. Lulu is going to head north towards Titus' territory, and using a level 1 key sphere, she'll make her way in and learn Provoke. Provoke will aggro an enemy so they only target that specific character. This will be useful for a few boss fights later on. Yuna will be getting some more stat increases, really just more of the same particular stats we've been increasing throughout the run, and she'll be using the other black magic sphere to learn Thundaga, which will be put to use right away in the next boss fight with Wendigo. Titus will get a fair increase of stats here, not much, but every little bit counts. We'll then switch our party to Titus, Yuna, and Riku in preparation for the next boss fight. So when we leave Makalania Temple, we're going to get chased by Guados on this path. Now most likely one would catch up to us and we'd have to run away from the encounter, but if you have very precise movement running away here, it's possible to reach the end and just barely avoid the encounter. I'd recommend using the minimap in the corner for guidance and walking as close to the inner path as possible. Not a huge time loss if you don't get it, but it is a pretty swag battle skip if you do. Get out of the way! So on our way back, Yuna may not have her overdrive fully charged, and this is a good opportunity to finish charging it if so. I generally will just attack the Snow Wolf with Yuna because her current weapon has Sleep Strike, and other enemies will tend to deal more damage than the Snow Wolf will if it falls asleep. Now we don't need it fully charged for the next boss fight, but we're about to lose Yuna from our party afterwards, and there's no good place to charge her overdrive until it's needed. And it is possible it'll charge up during the Wendigo fight, but even then, there's a chance Yuna isn't hit once during the fight, so this will at least guarantee it's fully charged for when we need it. So we'll heal up at the save sphere, and then we can head into the Wendigo fight. So the Wendigo fight is fairly straightforward. Yuna will be spamming Thundaga on Wendigo, and the rest of the party will be reviving fallen party members. 
Hina will take out Guado A first though, who will cast Protect on Wendigo upon death, which isn't going to affect the fight as we are only using magic attacks. And Guado B must be taken out after Wendigo, as they cast Shell upon death, which would reduce Nuna's damage during the fight. So Titus will be casting Haste on Yuna here, and if Wendigo kills Yuna, we'll want to cast Haste again after reviving her. Essentially, the more often Yuna gets hit, the longer the fight will take as she is our only source of damage for this fight. So Wendigo will raise its hands up when its HP is half gone, and they'll start to counterattack physical attacks, which is why we don't have Titus attack at all during this fight. Strangely though, Wendigo never raised its hands during this fight, which could be a glitch. So I mistakenly cast haste on Yuna here when I should have just defended, but it was no harm thankfully. Also I want to point out that it's entirely possible with very bad RNG that Yuna just keeps getting killed over and over and we run out of phoenix downs, or have too little to keep going. Although it's not very likely, it's still very possible. Also make sure no one is dead before finishing the fight so everyone gets their AP. So down below the temple, after talking with Yuna, we want to grab the level 2 key sphere from the chest here. So here in Sunubia Desert, heal up from the Wendigo fight, and then walk over to the forced encounter with Zoo. Titus will attack twice, and then Orin will join the fight. Some help. Now have both characters defend, and soon enough, Lulu will join too. And once this happens, Titus can flee the fight. Are you all right? We'll heal up again at this next save sphere once we obtain Riku. We want our party to be Titus, Riku, and Orin, but before switching the party, walk over to this next battle. This fight is another forced encounter showing us that the steel ability can take out Machina instantly. We can flee right away and don't actually have to use steel though. So this encounter forced our party to Titus, Riku, and Lulu. So switch Lulu out for Orin before moving on through the desert. And now we can focus on getting what items we need before reaching home. While making your way along, grab these two chests here containing a level 2 key sphere and 10,000 gil. So we need to finish collecting any remaining speed spheres before reaching home, and the first enemy we need to encounter is another zoo. We can steal smoke bombs from zoo, and those are needed to take out alkyones, which drops speed spheres. Hopefully when you encounter alkyones, you get the formation with two of them instead of one. The smoke bomb will guarantee an overkill, which is very nice. And once we have a total of 18 speed spheres here, we'll be done collecting them for the rest of the run. Also, if Orin's overdrive isn't fully charged by now, we can utilize the zoo encounter to help charge it up, and we need to make sure it's fully charged before reaching home. Likely Orin's overdrive will be full by now, but this will be the last opportunity to make sure of that before needing it for a boss fight later on. So there's a chest we want to get here, which Asandra Gora is guarding, so we gotta fight for it. This fight is simple, but very RNG dependent. Titus will cast haste on Riku, and Riku will cast death until it's successful. Death only has a 25% chance of working on Sandra Gora, so you may be trying to cast it a few times here. If the first two attempts fail, then Sandra Gora will get a turn in and use Seed Burst, which will inflict confusion. 
Here, Riku was inflicted, which is ideal compared to Titus or Orin being inflicted, as they could potentially kill party members. Luckily, Riku attacked herself and her confusion was lifted and she was able to continue casting death. After the fight, use an elixir on Riku so her MP is full again, as we have one more Sandragora to fight. Also, we can now collect these two teleport spheres. The next Sandragora is guarding our way into home, and will be the last thing we do in Sanubia Desert, so make sure you have all the requisite items needed before leaving. So I want to point out that Riku only has enough MP to cast death four times, which statistically should be enough, the bad RNG could leave us dry, so use an elixir if needed, and keep trying. So here again, we missed the first two deaths, and this time, Titus was inflicted with confusion. He decided to attack Orin, which is totally fine, but Titus could have hit Riku instead, and that would have been a huge mess to clean up. Luckily, Riku was able to keep casting death, and the fight finished just fine. So, it may stand to reason that a safety save be taken before these fights. Really bad RNG could potentially lead us to a game over here. It's a moderately low risk, so taking a safety save is up to you. So here in home, we're going to go into the sphere grid, and Titus is finally going to use the strength sphere we got from winning Blitzball. We decide to place it here because Orin is going to make his way over here at some point too and activate it. And again, without this strength sphere, Titus and Orin would be short on attack damage for certain fights moving forward. And really, there are no alternative battle scripts that work out. It really shows how much of a difference Force Strength can make or break a battle script. So after Titus gets his 8 additional strength, we'll finally be moving Orin along the sphere grid, and we'll start to see some real use from Orin moving forward. Orin is essentially going to unlock Waka's territory of the sphere grid, and make use of that instead of his natural path. And he's entering Waka's end path, so we'll see plenty of high stat nodes to be activated. So Orin is going to see a huge increase in his HP, Strength, and Agility here. His HP will increase by 1000, his Agility will increase by 11, and his Strength will increase by 20. The Strength increase here is quite massive and will make Orin a great damage dealer moving forward. Titus does have a higher Strength stat at this point, but eventually Orin will surpass him. We've mainly held off on leveling up Orin until now, because his starting agility worked out for a lot of the scripts used so far, and it hasn't been necessary to level him up anyway. But now, we're going to absolutely need to level him up, because we have a gauntlet of forced encounters coming up that we'll need to see some high damage output for. We'll finish up this menu by healing the party with a Mega Potion, which is slightly faster than running over to the Save Sphere. So the following battles here in home are all fairly straightforward. In this first encounter, Titus will haste himself and then kill the Guado. Riku will then use a silence grenade, really just for the damage and not to intentionally inflict silence on the bombs. Then Titus and Orin will simply finish off the bombs and that's one battle down and four to go. Also in the upcoming fights, Riku will be using lightning marbles, but depending on how your fight with Sphere Morph went, you may not have any lightning marbles left, but bomb cores and arctic winds will work all the same on the dual horns. So for the second battle, Titus will take out the Guado right away, and Riku will then use a lightning marble on dual horn A. Dual horn A is closer to its next turn than dual horn B is, so if we target A first, and after it dies, Orin's turn will be next, rather than killing B first and A going before Orin does. So then Orin will switch out for Kamari, and Kamari will use Lancet to learn Fire Breath. We don't need the newly learned Overdrive, but we need Kamari's Overdrive to fully charge up so we can use Stone Breath soon. So then we'll switch Orin back in and finish the fight. Also it technically would have been faster for Orin to attack before bringing in Kamari, but Orin could possibly crit the dual horn and end the fight, which would leave Kamari without a fully charged Overdrive. So after the fight, turn around and head back up the stairs. We're going to go into this room on the left, but before entering, switch Kamari out for Riku. 
Provide us some RNG that can make the fight go slower than we'd like, but nothing that could end the run. So Titus will kill the Guado and Riku will use a bomb core on Dual Horn A. Then Orin will attack Dual Horn B, and here we got a nice crit, which killed it in one attack. Now a non-crit will leave the Dual Horn alive, which means it's going to get an attack off and ideally we want it to attack Orin so we could proceed to finish it off. But if Titus or Waka were to die, we'll need to revive them so they can gain AP from the fight. So after the fight, we have some chests to examine that have Albed ciphers to solve. Lucky for us, we don't actually need any Albed primers to solve them, we just need to pick the correct answers. But you need to be careful not to accidentally pick a wrong answer, as each chest is a one-time chance to solve it, which would seem to serve as a measure to ensure the player doesn't spam answers until getting the correct one, so choose carefully. Also disregard getting the remedy, as it's not needed, just get the friend sphere. The remedy was something I picked up in routing in case it was needed, but it ended up not being necessary. So before we begin this fight, make sure Waka is switched out for Riku. To start, Titus will switch out for Waka, and Waka will defend. We've had Waka in these last two battles, so he can get some AP. Riku will then switch out for Kamari, and Kamari will use his Stone Breath Overdrive, which will simply end the fight. So the chests here are more Albed ciphers to solve that will net us a special sphere and a skill sphere. Before leaving the room, switch Kamari out for Titus. We have one more forced encounter coming up before we finish the home section. So this fight is very similar to the last one. Kamari will use Lancet to learn Aqua Breath, which will fully charge his overdrive. Use Defend with Orin and Waka until Kamari's next turn, and use Stone Breath again to end the fight. Before moving on, we want to pick up the level 4 key sphere and the level 2 key sphere in these chests. Then in the sphere grid, we're going to make some more progress with Orin. He'll be getting a total of 5 agility and 14 strength, which is another great boost in those stats. Orin will then use a teleport sphere to teleport to the same node Titus is on. Here, Orin can activate the strength plus 4 node that Titus made earlier with the strength sphere. After the sphere grid, change the party to Orin, Titus, and Kamari, then proceed on. Alright, here on the airship, we're going to heal up at the save sphere, and then proceed to the boss fight with Avery. So this fight does have a fairly straightforward script, but something to know is if Orin or Titus land crits on Avery, our script will change and I'll cover why here shortly. So starting off, Titus will haste himself, then haste Orin. Orin and Titus will be our damage dealers in this fight. Kamari will switch out for Lulu, and she's going to swap weapon to gain some AP. When it's Lulu's turn again, she'll swap Kamari back in, and Kamari will steal a water gem. So as damage is being dealt to Avery, there's a damage threshold here that once passed, Avery will automatically cast haste on itself. Now usually this will happen after Avery uses its Stone Gaze attack, but if Titus or Orin land a crit before then, Haste will be cast before Stone Gaze. So Stone Gaze is going to hit one of our three party members and inflict Petrification, which simply prevents that character from taking action. Depending on who gets hit here, the script will branch off into one of three outcomes, but really they all operate the same regardless of who gets hit, and the basic flow works like this. After Stone Gaze, Orin or Titus will attack, 
which will trigger Evray to cast Haste, which is then followed up by Inhale. Whenever Evray inhales like this, its next attack will be Poison Breath, and our goal is to kill Evray before this attack happens. So then Titus or Orin will swap out for Waka, and Waka will use a Soft on whoever was hit with Stone Gaze. Then Orin will use his Overdrive, which if he's currently swapped out, Titus will swap him back in. Orin's Shooting Star Overdrive is guaranteed to deal max damage, and this move will end the fight. Also, we'll see the first instance of max damage here, where Orin dealt 9,999 damage. This is the game's damage limit, so if an attack calculates higher than this number, it will reduce down to it. So now in this fight, where Orin landed a crit, Evray cast haste before Stone Breath. This means that Evray will be further ahead on the CTB bar, but we also have more damage dealt than usual. So basically what happens is we get to skip an attack and still be able to finish the fight before Poison Breath happens. Also getting this fight is going to be faster than a no crit fight actually, so hopefully you get good RNG here. Also there's a small variance that can happen in the non crit script where Titus may get a third turn after his two attacks before Avery uses Stone Gaze. The best thing to do if that happens is swap weapon and hope the turn orders work out for the fight. I'll also note that just about any fight in this game can see these small variances, and while the least favorable scenarios usually don't happen, it's always good to know how to handle these kinds of situations, and this is why I really do suggest these fights be practiced over and over so you have a better idea of what can happen during a run. Anyway, with every defeated, we get a drop of two black magic spheres, and then we'll proceed into Bavel. So we have a small gauntlet of fights coming up with warrior monks, and we want our party to be Titus, Orin, and Kamari before we engage here. These battles are really just Titus and Orin attacking the monks, which will die in one hit. So in this second battle here, I mistakenly attacked the YKT-63 with Titus, which should have been attacked by Orin, who can kill it in one hit. Titus should have attacked the monk instead. Because of this, the warrior monk got an attack in, and thankfully Kamari survived it. Remember, cut the ones that matter. I know, I know. So at the end of the cloister here in Bavel Temple, there's an HP sphere in this chest. Grab it before moving on. Alright, so here in the Via Perifico, we're going to play as Yuna for this segment. We walk forward past the first teleport pad to the second one here, and walk into it when the arrow is pointing up. We meet up with Orn and continue moving forward. There must be an We need to head immediately into the hallway here, so we'll get encounters with Maze Larvas. Encounters this before this hallway can be other monsters that we just don't want to fight. Stop. 
please fight with us. So we want to summon Valfor and build Valfor's overdrive. With one boost, we'll get the full charge and then we can dismiss Valfor. Yuna can then finish off the fight with Thundaga. So as we travel forward here, we want to get into a few more battles with Maze Larvas and get Yuna to level 5. We have the Aeon boss fights coming up and we need Yuna to increase her magic stat before we proceed. So now that Yuna activated the magic plus 4 node, we can head into the Aeon boss rush. So here we have to take on Isaru and his Aeons. There's no RNG to worry about here, just gotta follow the script and we'll guarantee victory for these fights. His first Aeon is Ifrit, and we'll be summoning Valfort and simply using Energy Blast to take out Ifrit. For the second battle, Isaru chooses his Valfor, and the game will allow us to use our Valfor as well. So we're going to go with Shiva for this fight. Shiva will start off casting Blizzara, and then proceed to use boost until their overdrive is fully charged. This usually takes 3 boosts to fully charge, but in this example it only took 2 boosts. It might be that when an Aeon dodges an attack, the charge is greater than just taking damage, but I'm not entirely sure about that. So now Shiva will finish off Valfor with their Diamond Dust Overdrive. Now Isaru will summon their Bahamut, and we'll continue to use Shiva. This time though, we want to grand summon Shiva. So Bahamut won't fight at all here, 
What's going on is there's a countdown until it uses Mega Flare. All we need to do is cast Blizzara four times and then use Diamond Dust to finish the fight. So now we're back to playing as Titus, and here we have the boss fight with Avery Altana, who apparently fell into the Via Perifico after we fought it on the airship. This battle will go much quicker than our last encounter, however, and that's because Avery Altana has a passive status called Zombie. Anyone inflicted with Zombie will suffer damage when they try to heal HP, meaning we can use healing items on the boss and deal damage that way. We can also use Phoenix Downs to deal damage, and all we have to do is use two of them, actually, to finish the fight. So now that we've successfully escaped the Via Perifico, it's time to take revenge on Seymour. But before that, we have some big moves to make on the Sphere Grid. Titus is going to use a teleport sphere and teleport to this HP node near where Yuna starts, and he'll be activating some strength, agility, and MP nodes. And most notable is Titus will be learning Hastiga, which will cast haste on the entire party and is an amazing upgrade from haste, so that'll be very useful to have. So Waka is going to be making a huge movement over to the Black Magic Spell Flare, which is the strongest Black Magic Spell in the game and is non-elemental. As a note, the Black Magic Spell Ultima deals the same damage as Flare as both spells have the same damage formula, but Ultima targets all enemies where Flare is a single target spell. Anyway, Waka learns Flare, but this is so Yuna can learn Flare with a Black Magic Sphere. And with Flare, Yuna will be able to deal some serious damage moving forward. In addition to getting Flare, she'll also get an increase in agility. And last, Orin will activate some strength and agility nodes. So heal up at this safe sphere, and then proceed to the boss fight with Seymour Nottis. So the script for this fight will play out in one of two ways, one being ideal and the other not so ideal. Although Starting out though, Titus will swap out for Orin, and Orin will talk to Seymour which will increase his strength for the battle. Then Yuna swaps out for Titus, who will haste Orin, and Orin will start attacking Seymour. The party will then get hit with a tier 1 black magic spell from the Mortar body, then Seymour will use a multi black magic spell that is tier 2 and will target two party members. Then either Kamari or Orin will swap out for Yuna, and Yuna will attack the Morta body with Thundaga, which will trigger its Mort Absorption that deals damage to Seymour in exchange for HP. Then Orin will attack Seymour again, and he may need to be swapped in for that. Then Orin will swap out for Lulu, and Lulu will switch weapon, again just for the AP. The Morta body will then use Shattering Claw, and after the attack, Seymour may or may not use an attack called Break. Ideally we don't want that to happen, which doesn't in this fight, but I'll show the script for if it does happen. The next move is to bring Orin in for an attack, and then Seymour will cast Flare which will kill one of our party members. Waka is then brought in to revive whoever was killed. Also if Titus was killed by the Shattering Claw attack, then Waka can use a Mega Phoenix in case two party members need to be revived. After that, Orn will attack one last time, and that will finish the fight. 
But before moving on, let's go over the break script, which actually has two variations and I'll show off the worst case scenario. So here, Shattering Claw killed Titus, and Brake inflicted petrification on Lulu. Now if Yuna gets hit by Brake, she'll be immune since she still has the Stone Ring equipped. But if Lulu gets hit, Yuna will have to use a Soft on Lulu. Either way, we then bring Orin in for an attack. Now since Seymour used Brake this time around, his next turn for Flare won't happen as soon. So instead, the Morta body gets a turn in, where it will cast Kira on Seymour. We then bring Waka in to revive Titus, and then have Orin follow up for the finishing attack. So after we've defeated Seymour, again, heal up at this save sphere before entering the Calm Lands. So while walking through the Calm Lands, we want to find an encounter with a Flame Flam and steal a Fire Gem from it. The Calm Lands are quite vast and I'm sure you'll have no problem encountering one. So after getting to Chocobo and heading to Remium Temple, we're going to do the Chocobo race a few times here to acquire some very valuable items. So during a race, you need to open a certain amount of chests before reaching the end, and depending on how many chests you open determines what items you'll get. You also can't hit any poles along the way, as that will deduct from your chest count. Now the first race you do, you need to open three chests and then reach the end to obtain the Cloudy Mirror which we don't need, but then you can race for specific items after that. And we want to do two more races where we get four chests and five chests respectively. Doing this will get us 30 pendulums and 63 stars. Also, these races are no joke. They will need to be practiced a lot to really understand the optimal movement needed to complete them. Every failed race is over a minute of time loss, so be super prepared for this section. So we'll finish up the Calm Lands with a quick trip to the Sphere Grid and have Orin activate a Strength plus 4 node, and then we'll change the party to Titus, Orin, and Yuna. So here at the fight with Defender X, we're going to see a lot of abilities getting their first time use here. Titus is going to open the fight with Hastiga, and there's one downside to Hastiga compared to Haste. It's a slower action, so Titus will be further down the CTB bar than using Haste otherwise. Now Yuna will start using Flare in this battle, and its damage is definitely on par with Orin's attacks. And as per usual, Orin will spam attacks for the fight. So when it's Titus' next turn, We'll bring Lulu in and finally put to use the Provoke ability, which will make Defender X only attack Lulu. Now Defender X does have a multitude of attacks to use, but we're going to lock it into one move doing this. For some reason, Defender X will only use Blast Punch when provoked, and Blast Punch is an attack that works like Demi. So now Defender X will loop Blast Punch on Lulu without her dying, while Orin and Yunik can continue to attack worry-free. Also, on Yuna's third turn, she'll swap out for Waka, and Waka will just defend for AP while Orn continues to attack for the rest of the fight.
So once we reach Mount Gagazette, we're going to purchase some equipment from this Ronzo here. We buy a Ductile Rod for Yuna and a Shiranui for Orin, which are both weapons that will increase their magic and strength respectively, and we're also going to customize these weapons soon. We also buy a Glorious Armlet for Kamari, which is armor that we're going to customize immediately. Those 30 pendulums we got from the Chocobo races can be turned into an ability called Master Thief, which will turn Kamari's Glorious Armlet into the Collector Armlet. So Master Thief will allow Kamari to steal completely different items from enemies than normal stealing allows. Now we can steal high value items and we'll see this put to use right away in the next boss fight with Biron and Yankee. So Kamari can steal level 3 key spheres from either Biron or Yankee here, and we'll get 2 per steal. Now we only need 2 more of these for the run, and here I stole 4 instead of just the 2 we need, which was just a small routing error actually. You only need to steal from one of them, so don't waste time stealing twice. So aside from that, Kamari will use a water gem on Yankee, and then a fire gem on Biron. And while that finishes the rather short fight, this one's not really over until we see the drops. We need to get four return spheres here, and each Ronso will drop two, but they each have a 1 in 8 chance of rare dropping friend spheres instead, which we cannot use to complete the run. It's the same situation as before, when we needed specific drops from Seymour and Makalania. So definitely safety save before the fight, and hope you get the return spheres here. So after the fight, we're going to go into the menu and auto-sort our items again, so they're more organized and easier to navigate, and then go into the sphere grid. Kamari is going to use a level 2 key sphere, and then move two spaces, but not activate anything just yet. He's setting himself up for Yuna to warp to his location. Then Waka's going to make a huge movement down to this area, where he'll use a level 3 and a level 4 key sphere to access an ability called Double Cast and learn it. Double Cast allows a character to cast two black magic spells in one turn, which is one of the best abilities we utilize in the run. But don't think Waka is going to be using it. So Titus will make a small move here and activate some more strength nodes. Yuna will then move and use a level 3 key sphere here, and then move one more level and use an HP sphere, and activate it for 300 HP, then activate the quick hit ability. Then Yuna will use a friend sphere to travel to where Kamari is located, and here she'll learn the Dispel ability. Dispel is a white magic spell that will remove any positive status effects from an ally or enemy, with few exceptions that don't apply to the run. Yuna will also activate this magic plus 4 node, and then use a return sphere to warp to the flare node. She'll move again and get one more magic increase, and then use a special sphere to learn double cast from Waka which will make Yuna's damage per turn with Flare absolutely incredible. Orn will finish off by using a skill sphere to learn quick hit from Yuna, and then we're going to customize Orn and Yuna's weapons with some really nice abilities. Using our return spheres and 3 stars, we can put the abilities first strike and 1 MP cost on each of their weapons, turning them into the Mirasame and Astral Rod respectively. Now Titus, Orin, and Yuna all three have first strike, which means they all get the first three turns at the start of a battle. Also, all of Orin and Yuna's abilities now only cost 1 MP, which means Orin will get to use Quick Hit repeatedly in a fight, and Yuna can cast Flare repeatedly, which is going to severely give us an advantage in boss fights moving forward. Guys. So as we make our way through Mount Gagazette, we want to get into encounters with these Machina mech leaders. Kamari can steal two frag grenades from these enemies. We want to do this twice, so we have a total of four, and will likely encounter two mech leaders before the next boss. Mech leaders can also be encountered in the cave atop Mount Gagazette after the next boss if you don't get the encounters on the way. 
Also, make sure you switch your party back to Titus, Orin, and Yuna after getting a steal with Kamari. Father, give me strength. So reaching this point here, heal up at the save sphere, and then we're going to head into the boss fight with Seymour Flux. Alright, so here we're going to see some serious damage strats at play in this fight. Titus will open with Hastega, and Yuna is going to double cast Flare, and we'll start to see just how powerful double cast really is. So Orin is going to start using Quick Hit here, which again, essentially is a normal attack with a faster recovery where the user's next turn will happen one and a half times faster than usual. And again, as pointed out in the beginning of this video, Quick Hit is an ability that was altered from the original PS2 release. And so this fight is the point of the run where we'll start to see all the major changes from the PS2 Nomix run, essentially because Orn is not getting as many turns as he would be otherwise. So as this fight goes on, Seymour is going to cast Flare, and this will kill one of our party members which means we have one of three scripts to follow depending on who dies. I'll have examples of all three of these scripts because they all have a unique turn order to follow, and I'll show them in order from slowest to fastest. So if Yuna gets hit, this becomes the slowest script because we're going to see a lot of party members swapping here, whereas the other two scripts only have one party member swap each. The first thing we do is bring Lulu in and revive Yuna, then have Titus taste Yuna, then have Orin resume quick hit. So bringing in Lulu immediately after the flare is critical to this script to being able to work. She needs AP for the fight, and if we try and bring her in even a turn later, then we won't be able to swap her back out in time for a necessary attack from Titus to win the fight. Also for some reason, Seymour spends a turn just staring at the party, and he doesn't do this in the other two scripts, and usually his next move is casting Reflect, which even if he did do that, it wouldn't affect anything. It's kind of weird he doesn't do anything else. So after that, Yuna will use Dispel on Seymour. Seymour casted Protect and Reflect on himself earlier, and Dispel is going to get rid of those statuses, which means Orn can now deal his normal damage, and Yuna can cast Flare again. And after Yuna double casts Flare, Orn will then switch weapons so that Titus can get one more attack in before Orn finishes off Seymour. We absolutely need the overkill on Seymour here, which Orn can achieve, but Titus cannot, so we can't afford to kill Seymour with Titus. So now looking at what happens when Orn gets hit with Flare, since Orn needs to be revived and be rehasted, he's not going to get any attacks in for a while. Yuna will be able to dispel Seymour's Protect and Reflect status, and then get a double cast of Flare off before Seymour will cast Reflect on himself again. So to explain Reflect, as its name implies, it reflects spells back to the caster. So when Seymour has Reflect, we can't use Flare as it would reflect back onto Yuna. And something interesting to know is that Seymour cast Flare on himself earlier, which then reflected onto our party. And say we had Reflect on our party when Seymour did this, well, it would bypass our Reflect as a spell can only be reflected once per cast. So after Seymour cast Reflect, Yuna will swap out for Luru, then Titus and Orn will be able to finish off Seymour on their own. So now for the script for when Titus gets hit, what makes this script the fastest is that Orin and Yuna retain their haste status and don't need to be rehasted, and Titus doesn't need to rehaste himself either, he just needs to get one attack in before Orin deals the final blow. So like in the previous script, Yuna will use to spell, and Seymour will cast Reflect on himself again, followed by Orin continuing with Quick Hit, and Yuna swapping out for Lulu. So one last thing to note about this fight, is that when we attacked Seymour with Orn and Yuna at the start, this was actually manipulating him into casting his Protect and Reflect spells. Basically, Seymour was reacting to our moves and trying to defend against us. And if we didn't manipulate him like that, then Seymour would have attacked our party instead, and that would have essentially made the fight impossible to win. So our drop reward here will be two level 4 key spheres, which will be needed to complete our desired sphere grid route. So after we've defeated Seymour, 
for the third time, we're going to make our way through the Gagazette Caves. Change the party back to Titus, Orin, and Yuna before heading through. And also, when leaving the swimming areas, be sure to change the party then as well. So if Yuna's overdrive isn't full, we can utilize the Behemoth Encounter to help charge it. We need it for not the next boss, but the one after. So no worries if it doesn't fully charge here in the caves. So before the next boss fight, we might have to get some AP for Yuna and Lulu if they're short here. Luckily there's this Machina encounter that we can fight that's pretty easy to win. The fight is a little slow, but trying to fight anything else here in the caves is not worth the hassle. So, how shall we do this? Okay, so here in the Sphere Grid menu, we're going to see Titus, Orn, and Yuna activate more of the same stat nodes we've been seeing so far. Lulu, however, is going to learn a new ability called Threaten. When a character uses Threaten, the target enemy will be stopped and cannot take action until that user's next turn. And this works out perfectly because the next boss is vulnerable to Threaten and we need this ability to win the fight. Now it is entirely possible to win the fight without Threaten, but it's severely inconsistent, and with it, the fight is 100% guaranteed to win. So starting the fight with Sanctuary Keeper, Titus is going to haste Orin, who's going to be dealing most of the damage in this fight. Then Yuna will swap out for Lulu, who's going to use Threaten. Now since Lulu's agility is very low, her next turn won't happen for quite a while, which means Sanctuary Keeper will basically do nothing this whole fight, allowing Orin to rack up lots of damage quickly. But before Orin starts attacking, we want to bring Riku in and use a Frag Grenade. The Frag Grenade inflicts Armor Break, which will cut Sanctuary Keeper's defense in half. So the Sanctuary Keeper has 40,000 HP. Doing some math here, if all of Orin's four attacks deal at least 9,000 damage each, and Titus's single attack deals at least 4,000 damage, then the Sanctuary Keeper will always die. And Titus and Orin are very capable of achieving this damage, no problem. Also, we want to make sure Yuna gets AP this fight, so bring her in before Orin deals the finishing blow. So this fight has some interesting changes from the PS2 route to talk about, but for now, we'll move on and I'll actually talk more about them near the end of the video during the summary. Aside from that though, our drop reward for the fight are two more return spheres. So Yuna was a little short on AP after that fight, and I decided to walk back into the cave and get into another Machina encounter for the needed AP. Now when I was first routing this, I thought it was a good idea to walk back into the cave instead of just heading to Xanarkin, mainly because I didn't think there were any fights in Xanarkin that were viable. But there are a few encounters that you can definitely fight though, like ones with Ahriman, the flying evil eye type enemy, or ones with fallen monks. Now I haven't done extensive testing on which fights are the fastest, so I apologize for the lapse in knowledge on that. But anyway, don't waste time doing this and just move on and get your AP in Xanarkin if needed. And when you are ready to go into the Sphere Grid, Orin will use a Return Sphere to warp to the Quick Hit node, and then obtain 4 Strength. Then Yuna will make a small move to get 400 HP, and then one more move to get 2 more Magic. So 
So as we make our way through Xanarkin, aside from getting more AP as I just mentioned, if Yuna still needs to fill her overdrive, then fighting another behemoth will be the easiest way to do that. Otherwise, we're just going to make our way through the cutscenes and the cloister trials before the next boss fight. So before heading into the temple, heal up at this save sphere. Alright, so the fight with the Spectral Keeper here has a dynamic going on where our party are on these platforms surrounding the boss. Spectral Keeper has a nasty counterattack after taking damage that will target the three platforms it is facing, and so we're going to manipulate the boss to counteract this. Also, we have the ability to move around the platforms, and we have to utilize this in order to win. So to start, Titus will cast Hastiga, Yuna will defend, and Orin will move over to the platform to his left. Yuna defends again, then Orin will swap out for Lulu, who will use Provoke. Yuna will then switch weapon twice, and then Spectral Keeper will finally attack, targeting Lulu. Also, for some reason, we get this long camera shot of Lulu after she dies. So then Yuna will switch weapon again, and Titus will use Mental Break, cutting Spectral Keeper's magic defense in half. Now we can actually see either Yuna or Titus go before the other here, which is a small variance in the script due to RNG. And all this really changes is who will swap out for Orin for his next turn. It doesn't matter too much though, as we'll execute the rest of the fight all the same, but these instances need to be taken into account. So Yuna will double cast Flare, dealing max damage with each hit. We'll then swap in Orin for a quick hit attack, and then Yuna will Grand Summon Bahana. Also, Yuna may need to be swapped in for this turn if she was the one who swapped out for Orin. So here we see the first use of Bahamut in the run, who is extremely powerful compared to Valfor. Bahamut has this really nice auto ability called Break Damage Limit. The max damage of 9999 that we've been seeing can actually be surpassed with this ability, bringing the max to 99999 damage. And Bahamut's Overdrive Mega Flare will absolutely break damage limit. So Mega Flare will end the fight, and our drops here will be two more level 4 key spheres. So we have another boss fight immediately after Spectral Keeper, but before that, we're going to go into the Sphere Grid. Yuna will get another increase of magic and agility, and Kamari is going to learn Reflect, which will be needed for the next boss fight. Switch the party back to Titus, Yuna, and Orin, and heal up before proceeding. Alright, so the fight with Unileska here has three phases to go through. Starting off with phase one, Titus will open with Hastiga and Yuna will start double casting Flare. This fight has a fair amount of RNG that I'll get into, but overall, this fight will be very consistent due to how much damage output we're capable of right now. So Unileska will always silence Yuna in response to her magic attacks. And for clarity, silence prevents a character from casting spells. Orin will use a remedy on Yuna to rid the silence, and then begin quick hitting, which will end phase 1. So I want to point out that, instead of using a remedy here, an echo screen can be used instead, and buying one during the Thunderplane shop will be faster than getting the remedy from a chest, which I already pointed out earlier was not necessary to get. So phase 2 will open with an attack on our party called Hellbiter, 
This attack will inflict our party with the zombie status, which again means healing effects will cause damage. This won't be anything to worry about though, and in fact will help us out in phase 3. Also, Unileska will now start counterattacking our party, but it's RNG if it happens. And if a counterattack happens, it'll get rid of any beneficial statuses, like haste for example. But this is another thing we don't have to worry about, and it's not worth Titus trying to recast haste on anyone either. The haste is helpful, but we can actually get through the fight without it. The best thing to do is to keep attacking and dealing damage to Unileska. Also, something important to note about her counterattacks is that they can crit our party. If no crits happen during the fight, we're pretty safe with our current HP, but crits can seriously mess things up if they happen too much. And there's nothing we can do about it either since we can't heal our party, so hopefully nobody dies and needs to be revived. So Unileska in Phase 3 is going to use Mega Death, casting death on our party. And since we have the zombie status, death will not affect us and we survive the attack. Also, Unileska will try to damage us using healing spells, and she'll specifically use regen next, which heals the character gradually every turn. Yuna could possibly die if she gets hit with regen, so Titus will be switching out for Kamari so he can cast Reflect on Yuna to prevent this. Now if Yuna reflects regen onto Unileska, she'll start healing her HP every turn, but it's nothing to worry about actually. We'll still be able to finish the fight just fine. So here, Orin got hit with regen, and since his HP is doing fine, it's nothing to worry about. Also, the turn order in Phase 3 will be pretty inconsistent due to Unileska's counterattacks, but just continue to deliver damage as our party's turns come up, and Unileska will go down soon enough. Also, one final note I want to make is that I've seen this battle begin where Orin's turn was before Yuna's in the first phase and it's important that Yuna gets the first attack with Flare for the script to work out. I only saw this happen once in my many attempts of this fight, and maybe using Switch Weapon with Orin would keep the script going, but I can't say for sure on that, and I figured I would at least share that it happened. So after the fight, we're going to do a quick Sphere Grid menu. Yuna will use a return sphere and teleport to this magic plus 4 node near the dispel node, and then we'll move over and learn the use ability, which will be utilized in the next boss fight. Then switch the party back to Titus, Orin, and Yuna. Back in the airship on our way to fight Sin, heal up at the save sphere before heading up top. So Sin has three phases that we have to fight, and starting in phase one, Titus will haste Yuna, and Yuna will begin to double cast Flare. Yuna is the only one who can damage Sin, so she'll continue her attacks while Titus and Orin defend. Also, Sin won't attack us during this phase, and will just remain motionless on its turn. So phase 2 is almost identical to phase 1, except here, Yuna will defend after her second round of flares. What this does is it manipulates Sin into remaining motionless on its next turn. Otherwise, had we kept on using flare, Sin would have attacked our party and Yuna would have died. So after defending, Yuna can continue to double cast Flare until phase 2 is over.
So phase 3 is a completely different fight where Sin's core is exposed and is being guarded by Sin's Bon Jene. We're going to have Titus haste Orin, and Orin will quick hit Sin's Bon Jene until it dies. So Yuna will not be casting any flares during this fight, because the core absorbs all magic attacks it receives. So Orin will take the helm on dealing damage here. Now Yuna can still help out though, now that she has the use ability, and will use a frag grenade on Sin so Orin can deal max damage with each hit. So Orin will keep quick hitting Sin while Titus and Yuna defend until the fight is over. Sin will cast some black magic attacks on our party, but it's nothing to worry about. Sin will also cast Gravija on our party, which is another Demi type attack that can't kill, so it's also nothing to worry about. And luckily, Orin's next attack will finish the fight. So we'll get a number of item drops from these fights, but importantly, we need the two return spheres from Sin. So the fight with Sin is not quite over yet, and we have another fight right after with Overdrive Sin. But before we engage, we have a quick visit to the Sphere Grid, where Titus, Orin, and Yuna will each be getting 4 more agility. Titus, however, is also going to be using a Return Sphere and moving back to this HP Sphere that's near an ability called Zombie Attack, which Titus will get after using a level 3 Key Sphere. Zombie Attack simply inflicts the zombie status on an enemy, and we'll see this ability come into play later on in the run. So we're going to switch Orin out of the party for Lulu, and then heal up at this save sphere before heading up top one more time. So the fight with Overdrive Sin is very simple, but there's a few interesting things that are going on with it. Sin's first few turns are spent drawing the party closer to it, and afterwards it will spend each turn charging its Overdrive, meaning we won't see Sin do much this fight. So after Titus hastes Yuna, she'll begin to double cast Flare, and will keep this up until the fight is over. And that's pretty much the whole strategy here. There's going to be a few more things we do though besides attack Sin that'll save us some time. So Yuna will be spending 8 turns attacking Sin, and in that time, we're going to intentionally kill off other party members, because we only want Yuna to be taking turns so we don't have to waste time defending with other characters. Lulu starts in this fight because she'll die easily, and because she gets so few turns due to her low agility. Riku also will die easily, so Titus will swap out for Riku, and Rika will just attack herself. So what's going to happen now is once Sin has drawn the party closer three times, Yuna's next attack will trigger its Gaze attack. Gaze is a counter attack that triggers after every six attacks it receives, but won't trigger until after Sin's first three turns. Now Gaze has four different variations that it can be actually. Three of the variations can each inflict a different status effect that's either Confusion, Petrification, or Zombie, and each party member has a 30% chance of being inflicted. 
Also, the fourth variation will only deal damage, but it's higher damage than the other three. Now, as far as the damage from the gaze goes, Yuna will be just fine, but we'll see Lulu die and hopefully Riku too. If Riku survives the attack, just keep having her attack herself. She might even get confusion and do it herself like she did earlier, saving a little bit of time. Also, here's an example of Yuna getting confused, which she'll just attack herself to lift it and continue casting Flare. So as far as the other potential status effects from Gaze go, we don't have to worry about any of them actually. Zombie isn't going to be a detriment, and Yuna still has the Stone Ring equipped and can't be petrified. So regardless of what exactly happens when Sin uses Gaze, the fight is very consistent and should play out just fine. We must go to him. Then we will. Let me take front. Good luck. Follow me. So once we're inside Sin, switch the party back to Titus, Orin, and Yuna. As we make our way along, we want to build Yuna's overdrive up again. It's not needed for the next boss fight, but for the one after. This isn't just a rock, is it? So all of the random encounters inside Sin are very strong enemies, and most of them will be fine to encounter. Although fighting the Animantois wasn't the best option, since it didn't fully charge Yuna's overdrive. A behemoth will be a more ideal enemy to encounter, and you're bound to run into one soon enough. So we have to make our way over to the top of this waterfall, and get the special sphere from this chest. Now here's a behemoth encounter, and we'll see it deal much more damage to Yuna than the Adamantois did. So reaching the end of the path here, Yuna's going to make a quick move on the sphere grid and learn Reflect, which will be needed for the next boss fight. We're going to switch Orin out of the party for Kamari, and also heal up at the save sphere here before heading up. So we're going to fight Seymour again, again, again for the last damn time. Thankfully, this fight is quite flushed out, and there's no RNG we gotta worry about, so that's nice. Titus will open with Hastiga, and then Yuna and Kamari will proceed to cast Reflect on every party member. Seymour's first attack will always be a volley of Fyragas, so this will prevent our party from taking any damage from them. Titus's next move will be Mental Break, and then Yuna will begin her Volley of Flares on Seymour. So Kamari's going to steal a Supreme Gem from Seymour, and this item which casts Ultima was originally going to be used in the next boss fight. But the Supreme Gem ended up not being used, as more effective strats had to be implemented, which I'll go over when we get to that fight. So after Titus uses Switch Weapon, Seymour's next move will be to spell on our entire party. This move from Seymour will always happen next due to our entire party having Reflect which is great because we avoid potential attacks from Seymour otherwise. So Titus will re-haste Yuna after Dispel so she can continue her attacks on Seymour. You'll notice Yuna had two turns here before Kamari's next turn, 
which if that happens, Yuna will need to switch weapon on that second turn so Kamari can swap out for Orin, as Orin needs AP from this fight. Yuna's next turn will still happen before Seymour's will though, and that'll be Yuna's last attack on Seymour that'll finish the fight. Finally, we can say goodbye and good riddance to Seymour. Alright, heal up at the last save sphere here before heading into the final battle of the run. Walking up to this massive structure, we'll get teleported to this area with a spinning camera where crystals will appear all around us. And we need to collect 10 of them. There are also these piercing pillars of light coming up from the ground that we need to avoid. Running into one will put us into a battle that we can easily run away from, but there's nothing to gain from them but time loss. So as we collect these crystals, we'll get a combination of 10 different items from them, seven of which are weapons we don't need, but the other three, which are a skill sphere, a white magic sphere, and an attribute sphere, are very much needed, and we'll be using them immediately. So we're going to visit the sphere grid one last time and get prepared for the final battle. Orn's going to start off using a white magic sphere to learn Hastiga, followed by getting an agility plus 4. Titus will not be opening the next fight with Hastiga as he usually does, so Orn will get the honor this time. Next, Kamari will move back to the center of the sphere grid where he started, and proceed to unlock his way to the black magic spell Ultima using three level 4 key spheres. Kamari learns Ultima just so Yuna can learn it from him. So learning Hastiga and Ultima here was a major route change from the PS2 Nomix route that had to be implemented in order to win the next boss fight. After Yuna learns Ultima using a black magic sphere, She's going to use an Attribute Sphere to get plus 4 Agility. Now Titus is going to be making a lot of moves here, where he uses a Skill Sphere to learn Quick Hit, and a Special Sphere to learn Use. He won't be actually using any of these abilities in the final boss fight, but he learns them so he can teleport to them, and then move to a nearby plus 4 agility node that he can activate. Titus getting an additional 8 agility here is absolutely needed for the next fight to play out correctly. And this is another major change from PS2 Nomix that was implemented in order to win the fight. Say Titus could only get 4 more agility here instead of 8, then the fight wouldn't work out. It was seriously that close to not working out. So with all that considered, I am so very happy we get to move into the final boss fight and show off a working script for it. I promise this will be quick! Hit me with all you got, Dan! So here we are facing off against Jekt, who's transformed into Braska's final Aeon. Titus will open the fight with Mental Break, and Yuna will follow up with using a Frag Grenade, which will set ourselves up to deal the most damage possible to Jekt. Orin's going to use Hastiga on the party, and now we're ready to start attacking. Yuna will start by casting Ultima and Flare with Double Cast, and Ultima is going to hit Jekt as well as the two Yu Pagodas we're up against which will cause them to stop moving and become inactive. On Titus' next turn, he's going to talk to Jekt, which will cause him to not take any action on his next turn, leaving us able to continue attacking uninterrupted. So Yuna will keep casting flares, and when Titus' next turn comes around, 
He's going to use his overdrive to deal max damage. Then Orin's next attack will shift Jekt into a different phase where he pulls Broska's sword out. So we'll continue to attack Jekt with Unit and Orin, and Titus will talk to Jekt again, continuing to prevent him from taking action on his next turn. Also we'll see Yuna use Quick Hit here, and this is to set her up with two turns before Jekt's next turn, where he'll finally make an attack. We'll also see the Yu Pagodas possibly start moving again, and it's RNG if it happens or not, and each Pagoda may or may not activate. So Titus will start attacking Jekt from here, and when it's Yuna's next turn, she's going to double cast Ultima, again to stop the Pagodas from moving if they're active, but this time they need to be hit twice to deactivate. So after dealing more attacks with Titus and Orin, We'll reach Yuna's turn again, and now she's going to Grand Summon Bahamut into the fight. So we'll use Mega Flare here, and this attack will deal over 37,000 damage to Jekt, which is really nice. Jekt, however, will still be alive after the attack, and will proceed to take out Bahamut. And this is good, actually, because if Bahamut didn't tank these attacks here, our party would have been hit otherwise, and we would have lost the fight. And after Bahamut dies, it'll be Orin's turn next, and Jekt is only one attack away from dying. So with Orin's final attack, we've officially secured the run, and all that's left is the finale with Yu Yevin. So the rest of the run has nothing to worry about actually, as the following battles are mostly just to wrap up the story. All Yuna has to do here is use Thundaga on each Aeon, except Ixion who we'll use Flare for, and that's really it until Yu Yevin. So I'll let these Aeon battles play out, and while this is going on, I'm going to take these next few minutes to step away from the scripted commentary and talk about some final things to conclude the video. Hey everyone. So I wanted to talk about how this video came about and why I made it. So, one day about four years ago, I was looking at categories for Final Fantasy X speedruns. I discovered this category called Nomix, and Nomix was only being ran on PS2, and I noticed that there was no HD remaster runs, and I didn't know why at first, but um, after looking into it, I discovered Nomix relied on using Orin's quick hit ability. Um, and, as I pointed out in the video, that was changed in HD Remaster. So, I'm not sure if that's exactly why no one was doing runs or not, or if anyone was aware of that, per se, but, you know, ultimately that's why No Mix couldn't be ran on HD Remaster in the route that it was, so... I ended up taking pretty thorough notes on the PS2 No Mix run, and then began routing it out for HD Remaster. The process was simply like running the old route until finding out where it goes wrong and then doing lots of trial and error until coming up with a route that does work. 
and there ended up being a number of interesting changes with the boss fights near the end of the run, like from Defender X on. Um, and I want to talk about those a little bit, actually. So the Defender X fight didn't really have any changes, despite being the first fight using Quick Hit. Um, that fight was really just slower than the original, and that was it for that one. The Seymour Flux fight, I believe, originally didn't have the branching three variations of the script. I think it was just one solid script that would work every time. And the original script, uh, none of the party members would die because you were getting that much damage off. Um, I sadly don't have my notes on the original PS2 run, and so I can't confirm that exactly, but I believe that was the major change was the three variations of the script and making sure that each variation was consistent. Um, Sanctuary Keeper was a fight that you could win, but it wasn't very consistent. And that's because sometimes Sanctuary Keeper would use this move called Photon Wings that would just wipe the party out. And it was RNG if it happened, so the original script wasn't reliable. And so I came up with the idea of getting threatened with Lulu, which actually required rerouting all the boss fights back to the crawler fight to include Lulu so she can get enough AP to obtain Threaten before Sanctuary Keeper. It was pretty surprising that I could even get that to work out, but it did, and it was pretty cool. So Special Keeper was kind of the same story as Sanctuary Keeper. Uh, we could win the fight, but it was very inconsistent, and uh, basically we just used Bahamut to deal the final blow with massive damage and Everything leading up to Bahamut is consistent, so that ended up working out that way. Um, Unaleska, Sin, and Seymour Omnis, those fights were all pretty much the same. Like, you do use Quick Hit during Unaleska and the Sin Phase 3 fight, but they're pretty much the same as before, just a little longer. So it was nice that they worked out that way. And the Seymour Omnis fight is pretty much the same as before, and I don't think it needed any rerouting, actually. Now, Jekt was probably the hardest fight to reroute, basically because we had to find a way to win the fight without taking a single hit from Jekt. And what we needed to see that happen was for all three characters to get more agility, for Orin to learn Hastiga so he could use that while Yuna and Titus get their mental break and armor break off, and for Yuna to learn Ultima because she needed to use Ultima in conjunction with double cast to get more damage in during the fight, and be able to target the Yu Pagodas when they became active again. The, uh, the single Supreme Gem was just not enough. So yeah, this was pretty challenging to route out, and I'm pretty proud of myself for finishing it, and I'm even more proud of myself for putting this video together to show it off. Um, I had a few more things I was going to say, but I think I'll leave it at that. And I'll put those thoughts down in the video description below, so check that out if you want to know a bit more trivia about this video. But anyway, um, thanks for listening, and let's finish the video out. So here we are at the very end of the run. All we have to do now is use zombie attack with Titus and then use a phoenix down with Yuna. And that's time! Thank you so much for watching. I'm on Hylig 47 and this has been How to Speedrun Final Fantasy X No Mix exclusively on HD Remaster. I hope you enjoyed watching. I plan on making more videos soon, so look forward to more content from me in the future. Until next time, much love.